Hey there, Duke fans. Welcome to episode 421 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. I am Jason Evans, your Sherpa through the wilderness on this episode. And we're, we're coming clean. We're going to be honest. This is coming to you midweek, but we recorded this a couple days ago. We recorded this on Sunday morning. We got done with episode 420, and then we immediately turned around and recorded episode 421. That's just how we roll here. We had too much content. There was too much stuff for one episode. So we had to put it into two episodes. And joining me for this episode, just like on episode 420, Donald Wine and Sam Klein. Donald, how are you feeling? Why am I asking you? I was just with you. I, I Look, I feel ready for this draft. Uh, there was a reason why we put, pushed it off. So I want to do some research. I think I got you. There you go. All right, Sam, you ready for the draft? Uh, yeah, I still have COVID, but I am going to kick both of your asses. <laughs> All right, so here's kick how this COVID works. first. Kick COVID first. I'm, then, I, then I, I'm not. I'm not going to beat COVID before I beat both of you. It, it's just. <laughs> I don't think it's. It's. Go- I've had. I've had like four horribly loud sneezes in the time that we've been recording today. Uh. Uh. You know, bless the mute button. So. Uh. I don't think it's going away in the next hour. If If this draft ends up being the cure for you to kick COVID before the end of the show, if it's this draft, then USA government, we want one trillion dollars. This, that's, that's all we're this, asking for. This draft is my ivermectin. <laughs> it's your ivermectin. Oh, my God. We're not going there, are we? No. <laughs> no politics. No craziness here. All right. Let's lay out the rules. So what we're going to do is this. The three of us will be conducting, conducting a draft of players who were one and done at Duke. They must be freshmen. They must. <laughs> so we're not talking one and done like transfers or anything weird like that. One and done freshmen. Arrived in Durham, spent one season, then went on to the NBA. They must have declared for the NBA draft after that one season. This is anyone throughout Duke history. So, so yes, it includes Corey Maggette, and yes, it includes Luol Deng. Sam, why, did you think that Maggette and Deng should not be included? Well, right. And so I, I clarified this this morning because the, the, those guys are both, they're both one and dones at Duke but they existed at Duke at a different time in basketball history when like most of Duke's one and done time has been since the rule change where you couldn't go straight from high school to the NBA. And really it's been since Kyrie Irving came to Duke that it became like a thing at Duke, the one and done Uh, era. Yeah. yeah, uh, They were not part of the one and done era. So I did need to clarify this morning that both McGetty and Deng, who I think should both be in the top 15, the guys who should be making the cut for these rosters uh, that th- they were both eligible. Yes. Uh, they keep are in both- mind. Yeah. Keep in mind that when we did this, there are 26 players that were one and done in Duke's history, which honestly, if, if, even if you take out the last 10, like 10 years and, and how many have gone in those last 10, in this last 10 years, that's incredible to have so few guys that are one and done throughout the course of history, because there's, there's teams that definitely have far more than that. All right, and, and we're going to do a snake draft. And by the way, Sam, you said 15. We're, we agreed that we are going to draft, you draft five starters, and then we'll also draft two bench players. So we will get all the way down. We'll have three seven-man rosters. And then when all is said and done, we will ask all of you to vote, to send us emails, vote and tell us which who had the best, who has drafted the best team of one and done players and we have a special guest to come after the break to to give like the first opinion on who won exactly exactly one of the winners of the dbr bracket challenge one of the people who picked the nca tournament better than anyone else is going to be joining us after the commercial break he will discuss his brilliant picking prognostication he will discuss some other cool stuff about his profile we're hoping to get some good duke stories from him and His most important job will be to evaluate this draft and tell us which team is the best of the three teams that we draft. So guys, the next thing we have to do is we have to determine the order and this will be a snake draft. So you're either going first and sixth or second and fifth or third and fourth, and then so on and so on. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to be very nice. I'm going to let you guys pick which of those spots you want to go. Sam, you have COVID. Do you want first, second, or third in the snake? I would like Zion Williamson, so I would like to go first. So Sam is going first. Donald, do you want second or third? Do you want two five or do you want three four? You want to sit on the curve uh, honestly, or do you want to be in the middle? 
honestly, I was not prepared for this because I thought we were going to do like some random draw. Uh, so I will go. I will go third. OK, so I'm second. Sam, you have the first pick. And I have to say, I there's no suspense on this one. in my mind. No, I would. This is like you just said this is, this is like when Cleveland got the first pick in 2003. Um, and it felt like the they, had had the, already... they had the jersey ready. Yeah, exactly. They were like, they were like, we got it. We got it. Uh, I will be taking Zion Williamson. Uh, he was the national player of the year. He did things that nobody has ever done in college. Uh, he made Donald and I jump out of our seats uh, at, at a game where he, he had a 360 dunk in an, in an actual game in Cameron. Um, he was the most electric thing in college basketball. And like, I still can't believe that he was real. And not only <laughs> not only can I not believe that he was real, uh, he was the third best recruit the two got that year. Uh, and and it was like it, it was madness. It was madness. The, the whole Zion Williamson experience. He no one expected him to come to Duke. He had Duke on his final list, but everyone thought he was like going to Clemson or going to South Carolina or something. Um, and he came to Duke and he won national player of the year and was just a total freak. I don't even need to read the statistics. Look, look, I will say this. I, was, I, I don't remember what number episode it was, but go back, ladies and gentlemen, and listen to the episode when Zion Williamson declared to go to Duke. Next to the lost episode of Louisville, the Louisville comeback, the lost episode, the lost tapes. Uh, that is the most giddy we have ever been on this podcast because literally this I was sitting been, outside. This would have been like January of It was January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, literally like I was standing outside a bar just laughing. Uh, for hysterically Jason's like I, I don't I, I couldn't even see Jason this is back before we could see each other we just could hear our reactions to each other and man they were great at the time I also uh, knew that I was going to be going to Fuqua and hadn't announced it yet and definitely the second most the uh, second biggest announcement of guys going to Fuqua related to Duke basketball or guys going to Duke oh, yeah. related to Duke basketball <laughs> for that year it was it was really it was Zion <laughs> and then me <laughs> Right. Exactly. So, so my comment on, on all of it is that I, I, I don't think it's fair, but I feel like Sam may have already won. <laughs> That's how great I, Zion was. I, I will say, I will say, I think that um, depending on, on like you guys could come back from this. Uh, there are there are some combos of Duke players that I think would be really, really nasty. Uh, and obviously, like Zion didn't make the final four and he had lots of great teammates and blah, blah, blah. So you could talk me into other combos of guys being better than this pick. All right. So I'm on the clock now. And by the way, it is worth noting if we haven't already said it, pro career does not count. We are only right. looking at what the player was career. in college, only what they were in college, but like just because, you know, maybe a guy was injured or something like that. He's still what he was as a college player in his one season, which I think is going to explain I'm taking Kyrie Irving second. And, and that may sound bonkers. It may sound crazy, but I'll tell you why I'm doing it. And Sam, I think you're in trouble because of it. I looked at positions and there are really, if you look at the one and done era, there are two point guards who are worth having. And then there's a huge, I mean, a huge drop off after those two point guards. I had to get one of those two point guards. I don't, I, and I could have gotten him maybe back around on the curve, but, but Sam, I suspect Donald is going to take a point guard and, and you are going to be looking at like, okay, am I taking Trevon Duval or like Frank Jackson as my point guard? I think you're, you got Zion, but your team is in trouble for a point guard. And, and, and the last thing is I, I do want to say, like, this isn't a crazy pick. Kyrie Irving averaged 17 and a half points per game, 4.3 rebounds. He had a PER player efficiency rating of 32.5, which is crazy, outrageous. Like, that player efficiency rating is higher than just about anybody, uh, any other one and done at Duke other than Zion Williamson. And there's only one other guy who's even in that ballpark. So um, I know he was injured, but when he played, Kyrie Irving was one of the best, maybe the best players in the country. So I've got no problem taking him on the, on the like electricity meter, which is a hard thing to, to exactly calculate. Uh, Kyrie Irving was like right at the top next to Zion Williamson. Like the, the, it wasn't just that he was efficient and, and talented and, and all that, but he looked, man, he looks different on the court for Duke. And, and he came in, remember right after Duke had won a national championship with like, 
the least electric team of all time. And then all of a sudden we got this enormous infusion of Kyrie Irving and it was like a whole new program. Uh, so first of all, Kyrie Irving was not going to be in my top four picks, but he was one of my top picks. But Jason, you were trying to sandbag earlier this week when you were like, oh, Kyrie's probably going to fall below a lot of these guys because he only played like 11 games in college. <laughs> I, I read through that. I knew you were going to pick him. Um, but here's the thing. Until Zion Williamson came around, okay, you have to take out the Zion Williamson just performances that he had. Kyrie performance, Kyrie's performance against Michigan State was the best performance I have seen by a college basketball player, period. End of story. That was For that alone, he will always be one of the best Duke players in my mind of all time. And even if he played 11 games, I thought he did enough in that 11 games that he was worthy of being one of the top 10 picks. But Jason, sometimes you have to read the room and sometimes you have to look and see, hey, maybe they, I can hold on to this. Very, very bold by picking him second. I was just going to say that. Yeah, I, and I, I, I sensed I could probably get him coming around on the number five pick, but I just didn't want to risk it. And I, and I, I'm, I'm, I bet I'm betting you're going to take Tyus as one of your next two picks. But I, I actually think, I think Kyrie is is even a level ahead of of Tyus Jones. But regardless, Donald, you're now up. Picks number three and four, go for it. Okay, so honestly, um, I'm going to go for someone who, I mean. The fact that he's number two on this list is still kind of a crime. He's he's never going to be number one, but like he's that good. He was that good in college. Marvin Bagley the third. Uh, Twenty one points per game. I almost I almost took him second. I probably should have taken Bagley yeah. and then Kyrie. But I think I think on a full season basis, Marvin Bagley like clearly the second best behind Zion. Yeah. Look, twenty one points per game, eleven point one rebounds per game. He even did assist. You know, just from two points, he was sixty five percent from the floor. Like. He invented a terminology. The second jump did not exist before Marvin Bagley the third entered college. And then you heard the words second jump like 55 times per game for the next five years. Um, and in relation and when Marvin Bagley the third was absolutely incredible in college. And uh, I'm going to go with him. He will be my center. Um, so, of course, there's a pluffer of big men, uh, but I'm going to go with him now. Uh, for, for the record, you don't have to declare what position he's going to play for you, but your right. team does have to make sense. And, and I suspect, well, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Move on. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's the funny thing was I, I wasn't going to pick this guy um, next, but because Jason has tempted me, I am going to go with Tyus Jones uh, only because first of all, Tyus Jones is Tyus Stones. That's how I was going to pick him. Um, I was going to hope that I would get him later on, but right now, Jason basically prompting me basically means that he is now on the minds of the two of you. And now I have to take him off the board for you. But here's the thing. I'm, I'm not mad at it either. 11.8 points per game, 5.6, 5.6 assists per game, 3.5 rebounds per game, steals 1.5 per game. Also, just probably on this list of the top, like several players, one of the most clutch players that Duke has ever had. A point blank period. I'll put him in there and he will be my guy uh, for the, I guess we are the fourth pick of the one and done draft. Yes. All right. So moving on now, and by the way, Great picks. And, and Tyus, like I said, I, I think you had to take him because Sam Sam is panicked now about a point guard. Oh, Sam's I didn't see no panic in his face, at all. but I, I, I went to remove all. all doubt. Duke has been dying to hear who, Duke has to hear been, who your point guard is going to be, Sam. Duke has <laughs> been, you don't need a point guard. We, you, you can get, you can have a bunch of other ball handling guys and you can figure it out. So uh, I ain't worried. Don't, don't try to psych me out here. You can't do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, so I, I, again, I've been looking at positions. And there are certain positions where there are a lot of guys and there are certain positions where you're sort of like, eh, I'm not sure who I'm going to get there. So I'm filling another position where I'm a little bit like, eh, I'm not so sure. I'm going shooting guard and I'm taking RJ Barrett. Uh, RJ, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a pity that he was somewhat overshadowed by the Zion Williamson year because RJ was out, outrageous. 22 and a half points per game, 7.6 rebounds per game, 4.3 assists per game. I, I looked at it, I was like, wait, RJ averaged four and a half assists per game? <laughs> Uh, dude was they, just out four, four point three of them were designed waves. Well, yeah, <laughs> they were in the air to dunk for dunks. <laughs> yeah, and I think I had to take him because I couldn't let Sam get RJ and Zion together on a team again. That that would have been truly devastating. So chemistry I'm is the, chemistry is important. The, yeah, with the fifth pick, I got RJ Barrett, and I I am set in the backcourt. All right, I've got I've got a few 
uh, options here that I think play well. The great one of the great things there are many great things about taking Zion Williamson, but one of the great things is that he can play a few different positions on the court. If you have a relatively small team, he can be your center. If you have a relatively big team, he can be your small forward, and you're probably still going to be pretty good. So I'm going to go just sort of you know most impact uh, on a on a Duke team. I am not going to have Zion Williamson. Uh, as my center, I am going to have Jalil Okafor as my center. I've now got two great passing big men, as well as two great rebounding big men. Um, Jalil Okafor was um, would like couldn't get anywhere away from the basket, but inside of ten feet was just an absolute force. Nobody could stop him. Um, not the best rebounder that the Duke has had in the one and done era, but serviceable enough that he and Zion are going to just gobble up. Uh, balls and and when we talk about having size in the post, Okafor and Zion together are going to prevent everyone from getting anywhere near the basket. And and I'm still not worried about ball handling, so don't don't even. Don't, oh, and, and I guess I have okay. another pick. You got? I was gonna say you got another pick. Let's let's see what you're doing now. All right, so now I need to get ball handling. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've now got I've now got two two bigs, and and the question now is, am I going to overwhelm you guys? with size and ball handling, which I think I can do. Um, or am I going to get someone who, who might be more of like a, not like a classic point guard. I don't think we have any really elite ones left since, as you pointed out, Jason, you already took both of them. Um, so I think I'm going Jason Tatum here. Uh, and so I've now got a team that is very big. I've got Zion Williamson. I have Jolly Okafor and I have Jason Tatum. I think that between Zion and Tatum, I've got a fair amount of ball handling and uh, again, when it comes to size, good luck getting around my dudes. Jason Tatum, his one year in college was super fast. He was uh, super shifty and he could he could shoot from outside. He has developed a lot more in the NBA. Uh, and, and I think if we're doing this draft on sort of NBA performance, um, Jason Tatum is, is also probably near the top. I'm taking Jason Tatum. Uh, I guess he's going to play the three for me, although at this point, um, positions are really kind of going to be irrelevant on my team. <laughs> yeah, you you got some position issues, my you friend. Get the monsters, basically. I don't mind. <laughs> I, I honestly, I'm 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 totally fine with it. Uh, good, like Tyus Jones. Good luck against against my guys. All right, so I, I I'm I'm going small forward now, and I, I'm really torn. I I was going to take Jason Tatum if he was still on the board, um, but I'm really torn between Luol Deng and Brandon Ingram. I think I'm going to take Brandon Ingram. A little bit of a better outside shooter than Luol Deng. Brandon Ingram averaged 17 and a half points per game, almost seven rebounds per game and hit 41% of his three pointers. Um, and, and those arms, those long, long arms. I am, I am really looking forward to the amount of defensive pressure that we're going to be able to put on teams with, with the guy like, like Brandon Ingram. So that is my pick. He's going to be my small forward, Brandon Ingram uh, going with what is what we're up to now that one uh, Jason, I, I think I think a very interesting comparison between Ingram and Deng like really really similar players especially um, from the ways they played in college as you said Ingram a, a slightly better three-point shooter but a lot of the same skill set in terms of like you just can't deal with all that length yeah and and I literally I, I picked him because of the three-point shooting like I said he was over 40 percent on threes and and Luol Deng was just about 35 36 percent on threes um, 5% may not seem like a lot, but, but it, it actually is over the course of a season. Um, and so that's why I went with Brent Ingram. Donald, you're up. Yeah. So for me, uh, it's funny. You mentioned, uh, uh, Brandon Ingram, cause he was one of the top three on my board, but he was, or left on my board, but he was number three. So I'm going to go with the top two guys that are left on my board. The first one, Paulo Bancaro, uh, goes without saying one of the best players that we have seen at Duke in a long time. Uh, he's going to be one of my bigs also can handle the ball. So I have some more guys that can handle the ball. And then for the, I guess my, we're going back up the snake, uh, Luol Deng. Um, I think people forget how great Luol Deng was in 2003, 2004, man was a wizard all over the place. He, again, he could handle the ball. He, he didn't have as great of a three point stroke, but he could hit the three, but he also could take you to the rim. He could pass, he could rebound, he could do it all. And also he was the consummate teammate. And I think that's important. Uh, he, everyone who plays with him was the better for it. And I have guys now that can handle the ball. They can shoot the ball. They are clutch and they can go to the racket. Will. Um, and I think that's what I need on this team. Okay. I'm up again. And, uh, and I'm actually Brandon Ingram, I think is going to switch from my small forward to my power forward because I'm going justice Winslow. 
Um, and uh, Justice, 12 and a half points per game, six and a half rebounds per game. Dynamite defender, dynamite defender, g- good outside shooter and winner. I-, I feel like Justice wins those major, major position as he plays winner. And I feel really great about having him uh, in my lineup and just brings a lot of physicality and athleticism. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that Justice was still around. That's who I got. Sam, you're up. All right. I think I need someone who's a little bit smaller. I think I've gone for, for almost too much size. Um, I am going to take a guy for both defense and shooting, maybe the most underrated Duke shooter among the, the one and dones because of just the volume of threes that he put up as a, as a Duke freshman, I'm taking Gary Trent jr. Uh, I think he is going to play really well with, with my guys. He's not a ball handler. Um, he's definitely, he's definitely an off ball guy. Um, but at six, six, He's he's got still some size to uh, to to pick up other guards, and I am excited to just leave him on the wing to get open threes while everyone is focused on Zion and Jason Tatum. So just so we're clear, Gary Trent Jr. shot worse from three point range than Brandon Ingram did. But yeah, you you go, you be you. Uh, but for volume, but for volume, he's right. I think I, 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 you, someone can check me on this, but I'm pretty sure that Gary Trent shot more threes than Brandon Ingram did. Yeah, that's so, that's true. I'm, but I, yeah, yeah, I, I, and he's uh, a good, he was a, he's a good shooter. He's not as good as he's become in the NBA. No question about that. Go for it. <laughs> Have fun. All right. <laughs> you've got one more pick to fill out your starting lineup, I think. All right. So I need to, I, now I'm, I, I, I keep failing at this, uh, at this snake draft thing. So you, you need a point guard, my friend. You need someone to handle the ball because Gary Trent, by the way, wasn't a great ball handler. No, can't handle the ball. No, I, at this point, at this point, Zion Williamson's my point guard. And I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) whatever, Um, whatever, man. Uh, I am going to, I'm just going to overwhelm the crap out of other teams. Um, One thing I could take Austin rivers and call him my point guard, but I feel like we just have a chemistry disaster, like just ready to (laughs) ready to go. If, if that's going to be the case, Um, yep. Man, there are so, <laughs> there are so many good players that I want to plug in, but but there's already like there's already too much size. So, Jason, you might you might be right on this front, um, but I don't care. I just feel like I have such a I feel like I have such a talented team. Like regardless of this, that I need another I need another wing player. I probably need a little bit more defense than I already have. I'm going with Cam Reddish. Uh, uh, my team. <laughs> My Are you is, kidding me? No, no, I love hey. it. I love it. Oh, okay. It's it's in the books. I, and and look, but Cam's a fine player, but I can't believe you 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 were. It's nothing but shaky ball handlers. Gary Trent and Cam Reddish were both guys who I you were you nervous that, when they. Oh, I, can't I told believe you that it. Zion Williamson's my point guard. Oh my um, god! You know what okay. we're gonna do? He might be the best you know, point guard on the on the list. You know what we're gonna do? <laughs> there's two things. There's two things my team is gonna do a lot of: turn the ball over and dunk. <laughs> Uh, we're, also, sure. we're also we're sure. also going to play it. We're also going to play a ton of defense. Um, um, my team is ridiculous, but I love them. All right, so I'm up, and I got to fill out my fifth starter. I uh, and and I feel like I'm good every place, but I need a, a big man, and and it's a very easy decision for me. I'm taking Wendell Carter as my center, as my big Wendell. What well, I mean, a fabulous 13 and a half points per game, nine rebounds per game two blocks per game. I mean, of all the guys on this list, he's one of the, he may be the best rim protector. In fact, I think I, I maybe, maybe Zion, but I th- actually think Wendell, Wendell averaged more blocks than Zion did um, and hit 41 and a half percent of his three point field goal attempts better than Cam Reddish, better than Gary Trent, Sam. I have a, my, my centers, I better three point shooter than your shooting guards. Um, and I, I've mentioned this PER stat player efficiency rating, a 28, 0.2 PER, which is super high. One of the highest PERs that you're going to see around Duke basketball. Wendell Carter, easy choice for me as my as my center. Donald, you're up uh, to fill out your starting lineup and give us your first of two substitutes. Okay, so to round out my starting lineup, uh, I, I want to go with someone who is a shooter. Um, I have some guys that can hit the clutch three, but I want a guy who can be consistent throughout the game. I think there's no better player left on this board right now than A.J. Griffin. Um, A.J. Griffin hitting 44.7% from three. And honestly, there's you know, wow. he, was, he, he was hitting more than that um, before he had a little lull in the season. 
but I will go with AJ Griffin as my shooting guard. But at the other, at, at, I say that to read into my next pick because now I'm looking for you know someone who can play multiple positions or relieve multiple positions and have guys shift around. Now I'm looking at the top guy on my board and I'm thinking, okay, I have a few guys at this position, but I know those guys can also shift around if necessary. So I'm going with volume scoring. I'm going with Jabari Parker. Uh, Jabari Parker, 19 points per game, 8.7 rebounds per game. As a small forward, basically, he can also play the four. Paulo Bancaro can play the five. Lil Ding can play the three or four. So I have some versatility with this. Also, Jabari Parker, 1.2 blocks per game, 1.1 steals per game. So on defense, even though he wasn't, he didn't get the, the credit he deserved uh, at that level of being a great defend, defender, the man could defend when he needed to. And again, I can fill those stats up if I needed to. So uh, I'm going with Jabari Parker right there. All right. So I'm going to say, no, he couldn't defend. <laughs> he was wait, a hey, wait, your was team, Donald's- wait, your team has your team. Uh, Donald's team has, has Marvin Bagley. He has Paulo mm-hmm. Bancaro. He has AJ Griffin. He has Jabari Parker. Those four guys are not, they, they, they're going to really struggle on defense. He does have, he does have two really good defenders. Um, he does. Yes. Tyus mm-hmm. and Luol are very good defenders, but I, all right. So it, my pick, and, and uh, it's an easy, my, my first guy off the bench, easy choice. Uh, Vernon Carey, 17.8 points per game, 8.8 rebounds per game, a player efficiency rating. Are you ready for this? Of 34.1. So I'm going to tell you right now, Zion Williamson had a, had a PER of 40. No one in Duke history or, or among the one and dones. I checked all of them. No one has a PER higher than 31 other than Zion and Vernon Carey. It is a crime against man that I'm getting Vernon Carey this late in the draft. When you look at Vernon Carey's statistics, when you look at what Vernon Carey did on the floor, when you look at his versatility, because he's going to play both center and power forward for me, I, it is it is insane that he is still available uh, for me at this point. I, I'm thrilled to get this guy. That was pretty solid. I mean, he, he's, he's a guy we, we talked about in the last show that he was underrated uh, because he came after right after Zion, Cam, and, uh, and RJ. But I do think that's a really solid pick because, again, he can play multiple positions. All right. I am down to my last two picks. The first guy that I'm going to take is a uh, consummate guy off the bench for Duke as a one and done. That's Corey Maggette. Um, obviously did not, did not play the most minutes, um, but was electric in the time that he played at Duke. I am saying that from watching highlights. I do not remember Corey Maggette's one season in Durham, but I know that he was freaking awesome. Um, and that, you know, that before Duke got this, this run of crazy athletic wings that Corey Maggette was like the crazy athletic wing that Duke had sort of once upon a time. So Corey Maggette is my, is my six man which means I've got one more pick and there are a few uh, sort of up and down inconsistent guards that I I think you could take here. It feels like to me now that Jason's gotten Vernon Carey, that all of the like decent big men have been taken um, and that there's a, there's a pretty steep drop off on, on bigs who are left. So I'm, I'm doing this out loud because I haven't made this selection yet. And I'm going to, by the time I finish my monologue here, there are two guys left. I think that are, that are sort of worth taking for me, uh, and I'm down to Austin Rivers and Cassius Stanley. Um, Cassius Stanley being probably more accepting of his role coming off the bench. Austin Rivers being a little bit more electric and a little bit fiery. Um, and what I wonder in taking Rivers is, is he going to insist on having the ball in his hands when there are so many other guys on the team that clearly should have their, the ball in their hands ahead of him? Um, but on the flip side, Austin Rivers has the ability to make the big shot, which... Like if you, you know, someone's already got Tyus Jones. Uh, I, I would love to have Tyus Jones in this team, but I think for that reason, we I can't. think for the, I think for the, yeah. And well, I, I have cam already, but I think for the clutchness, I want, I want Austin rivers at his worst. Um, Austin rivers is like a locker room cancer. Who's going to completely derail my season. But if he's like the sixth most talented guy on the team, then I'm kind of okay with it because he's probably going to get put in his place a little bit more than he did in his. And, and by the way, I am, I am uh, crushing him right now during this monologue. I thought Austin <laughs> rivers was a ton of fun at Duke, yeah. despite the fact that the team was like all over the place. So I'm taking Austin rivers as my final pick. Uh, I, I will freely admit that, uh, that I was also trying to decide between those two guys. So you made my choice easy. 
and, and and actually I had Cassius Stanley ahead of of Austin Rivers. Perfect. I think especially especially at this point in the draft because I don't need an alpha. I need a guy who who can fill in and do a lot of different interesting things. Um, and uh, I, and and I like Cassius Stanley. Uh, there there are a lot of guys on these lists who are only committed to one end of the floor. Cassius is, was committed at both ends of the floor. And, and the notion of Cassius flying up the wing as Kyrie throws lobs and RJ Barrett throws lobs, but you know, both those guys, I I'm, I'm loving that. So I got Cassius Stanley as the last guy on my team. So that leaves the last pick to me. And it's very interesting because we have uh, four guards. Should we, yeah. Should we, uh, Hey, should we lay out everyone who's left just so everyone. Yeah. Knows so I'm going to lay out what's, what's left right now. So yeah. we have Trevor Keels. We have DJ Stewart. Frank Jackson, Trevon Duval, Harry Giles, and Jalen Johnson. Um, Jalen Johnson is out. Um, I, I need a guy who's going to stick around um, for more than 13 games. Um, oh, you need a guy who's going to stick I, around for more than 13 games? Too bad uh, you didn't get Kyrie. Well, there's a difference well, in being hurt and sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> hurt, 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 not hurt, not pride hurt. Um, Harry Giles, uh, I thought was one of those talents that we didn't get the best of him at Duke because of his injuries. And it's, it's, it's very unfortunate yeah, you for him. So him. I'm not, you can't take him. Yeah. No yeah, one's, no one's seen the best there. of Harry Giles since he was like 15. Right. So that tragedy. leaves the guards. And right now I'm looking at my team. I have, again, I have size. I have some shooting. I have the clutch gene. And what I think I need is someone who, and I got guys who can play multiple positions. I think I need a guy who can distribute the ball. Um, and I think any guy who can back up again and play a little bit of defense if necessary, uh, not necessarily called on to score a lot. Wait, Donald, before you make this pick, I'm going to be so sad for you, whoever you take, because he's going to be flawed at, at the thing that you need him to do. Continue. <laughs> do you, oh, wait, wait, wait. OK, so before I make the pick, do you guys do you guys know who I'm picking? I am so afraid you're going to take Trey Duval in this. Role. I think he's take, I, th- I think the choice is either. Duval, Trevon Duval or, Jackson. or Frank Jackson. It's it's only the, it's those two guys, and it sounds like he's going to take Trevon Duval. It would sound like that because I because you're right because he actually again he was a guy that and also he was teammates with um uh I I blanked who he was a teammate with but he distributed the ball a lot five point six assists per game he, is what I'm looking for didn't here. he distribute that's the ball a lot to the other team. <laughs> So yes. I was going to say, but so did See, your team too. So, <laughs> so, so wait, so wait, I didn't get to finish my sentence. I said, you're either going to take Trevon Duval or Frank Jackson. The rest of my sentence would have been, you should take Frank Jackson. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. Trevon Duval, Jackson. famous, I, famous for only having one functional eye, which <laughs> this is true. Super also not helpful for having a, a name, a uh, call back to our last episode, a, a name that we could not pronounce until midway through the season uh, correctly. Um, so, uh, but yes, I'm going with Trevon Duval. Uh, not necessarily because of, again, what he provided from the offensive front, but more about st- distribution of the ball. And really, Tyus Jones is my guy. Tyus Jones is playing 30 to 35 minutes in a game on this team, and I just need a guy to spell him. I think Trevon Duval can handle the offense for five to ten minutes while, tr- while Tyus gets his rest. So that's my pick. All right, guys. So uh, we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back from the break, we're going to discuss how, how good our teams are. We're going to discuss why my team is the best. And we're also going to bring in a very special guest. Uh, We will have that to you. Stick with us. Back in one second. Okay, we're back from the break. And it's time to bring in our special guest. Joining us now is Mitchell Davis. And Mitchell is a very, very important person because... This year, there were like something like close to 100 people who participated in the Duke Basketball Report Bracket Challenge. Mitchell had the best bracket of anyone. Uh, dude, congratulations. Uh, and and we, we said the prize for winning the Bracket Challenge was that you got to appear on the DBR podcast. Wow, Mitchell, I, this must be like the greatest day of your life, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> well, it, it's definitely up there. <laughs> uh, you know, it wasn't that complex a strategy. I was in a pool where everybody's taking Duke. So the two criteria were don't take Duke and don't take the overall number one seed because number one, Gonzaga's never won anything. 
<laughs> so, you know, thank you, Kansas, uh, for, uh, you know, just thank you, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> so you got, you had Kansas winning it all. Yes. And, and, and there were surprisingly few people in the pool who took Kansas. I'm not a Kansas fan by any stretch. But as I said, the two criteria were not Duke and not the number one overall seed. And I was at the game in Las Vegas. So I had seen Gonzaga lose in person. And it was not Damn. a stretch to think that Gonzaga could lose again. <laughs> it, it, was, it was interesting because uh, a lot of people in the pool actually had. I, let, let me ask, who you, did, did you have Kansas facing in the final? I did have Duke. I had Kansas and Duke in the final. I say that because most people in the pool had Duke versus Kansas as their final. It's just that most people picked Duke, and you were one of the right. few that picked Kansas. Yeah, Donald right. and I both had Duke versus Kansas. We just had it the other way around. Right. So and, the, and, the tie, and the tiebreaker I took was the 72-65 score that Duke won when they beat Kansas in, in 91. I just flipped it, and I thought that would be the bookend to Coach K's career was this time losing to Kansas 72-65. Oh and my God! I love the history. He was. I love I mean, the history. That's great, man. He had he had strategy and poetry in his picks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and 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 Mitchell, by the way, uh, you know, if you want to consider making picks to be gambling, you're a bit of a gambler, I understand, right? Yes, um, I play in a lot of the big poker tournaments in Las Vegas. Uh, I'll be playing in the World Series of Poker. It's in June this year. You know, they've been moving the dates around. So this year it starts around Memorial Day and goes through July. And I played in it uh, a few times. It really kind of started with, it was on my bucket list to play in a big tournament someday in my life. And about 15 years ago, I played in a satellite, which is a small tournament where the prize is entry in a big tournament and I paid $300 to play in a tournament and I won a seat in the world poker tour $25,000 championship so it cost $25,000 to enter the championship and I got in for $300 won a week at the Bellagio the entry in the world poker tour I made it to day two I didn't win any prize money but you know once you come close to winning millions it's like, well, I could do this because you see the, the other people are just regular people. They're famous people. Ben Affleck was in the tournament. James Woods is in the tournament. All of the top pros, uh, Doyle Brunson, Daniel Nagrano. So you're you're around a lot of these famous people and you say, start thinking to yourself, I can do this. Well, and I want to be clear. You can do this. You made a World Series of Poker final table, didn't you? Yes. Uh, in I, 20, uh, that is a, wait, well, uh, tell, tell the story, but I would just want to say, Dude, that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in, in, in 2012, we were down to the final two tables. And all of a sudden, the direct tournament director says, OK, everybody stop. And we're all sitting at my table like, why are we stopping? And it turned out that two people got eliminated at the other table. So they walked us over to this kind of well-lit area. It wasn't on TV, but it was being live streamed. So, you know, they come out with the microphone and introduce Mitch Davis from Irvine, California. And there I am. And, you know, one guy gets eliminated and another guy gets eliminated. And at one point I was the chip leader. But uh, as is the nature of these things, when the end comes, it comes very suddenly. <laughs> like one minute you have chips, and the next minute they're gone. Uh, congrats, though. I mean, that's that's I've played in, uh, I, I think now about a half dozen um, World Series of Poker tournaments. Um, I am not nearly as good as you. You, you have many more caches. Uh, uh, can, can you tell folks how much you won when you made that final table? It was that entry fee was three thousand dollars, and I won twenty five thousand and change. Not bad. <laughs> not bad. At not all. bad days work. Yeah. No. All right. Hey. So, so Mitch, we're going to ask you to do something for us now. As you know, earlier on this episode, we all drafted. One and done players. We tried to put together the best team of one and done players. And the way we're going to do this now is I want each of us to sort of present our team to you and make the case why our team is best. Um, and and I'm, I'm happy to go first because my team is the best. And then you can tell us which team you think is the best of all. The, my team is um, Kyrie Irving at point guard, RJ Barrett at shooting guard, Justice Winslow is my small forward, Brandon Ingram at power forward. And Wendell Carter is my starting center. I've got a big and a wing on my bench. I have Vernon Carey and Cassius Stanley coming off my bench. I think my team 
I think I probably have at least darn close to the best defensive team out there. And there's tremendous versatility in, in a number of these players. Sam, go ahead and introduce your team and try and explain how the heck you're going to bring the ball up the floor because you have no guards. Jason, as we've discussed many times already, <laughs> Zion Williamson is my starting point guard. I also feature, also <laughs> positions don't matter. It's 2022 or it's whatever year these guys played in college. The rest of my starting lineup includes first team All-American, Charlie Locafor, some kind of All-American, Jason Tatum. I don't have all the... No, he was not, Jason Tatum was not an All-American. Was not an All-American? Well, no. he was freaking awesome. No. He should have been. Uh, Gary, <laughs> Gary Trent Jr. and Cam Reddish are, are also out there for me. Corey Maggette and Austin Rivers are coming off the bench. If you don't think that my team is electric and huge and athletic and super duper cool, then you are full of garbage. And uh, I don't care. I don't care who you're trotting out there. I've got Zion Williamson. <laughs> All right, Donald, your turn. And so for mine, I have Marvin Bagley the uh, third at at the big at the big spot. Ty Stones. Uh, we don't have Jones here. We just we just have Ty Stones, Paulo Bancaro, Luol Deng, and AJ Griffin as my starting five with Jabari Parker and Trevon Duval coming off the bench. Uh, I got versatility. I got size. I got rebounding. I got the clutch gene. I got guys who've gone to Final Fours and won national championships. I got it all. I got it all. By the way, Sam, I looked it up. Jason Tatum was third team All ACC, not an All American. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mitch, it is your turn. Who drafted the best team and why? I I don't know if it's going to surprise you that the tiebreaker in this came down to the picks at the very end of the draft and not at the very top. Cause at the top, there were a lot of great players on all three teams. And I was leaning heavily toward Tyus there till the end Donald, but you just missed, you just missed <laughs> the, the difference maker to me was um, Sam taking rivers over Cassius Stanley. I thought that was a really, really strong pick getting Rivers late in the draft like that. See, this guy, yeah. this guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> by the way, Austin by Rivers. the way, we're editing and everything. We're, we're editing everything you said after Donald had it with Tyus. That's we're just, <laughs> everything after that. No, I'm keep going. I, uh, full disclosure. I'm editing this episode. So uh, we, we're just leaving. <laughs> Everything's getting left in. Uh, no mistakes here. We just <laughs> and, power right through. <laughs> and I don't know how Tatum is third team all ACC. Wasn't Duke the first team that was ever had to play four games to win the ACC tournament? Yes. I mean, the, yes. The, that four games that Duke won on on Tatum's back um, was was just amazing. I I, I, I th you got to give that a lot of credit what what Tatum did with that team. So it sounds like you've picked Sam as the best. Team. I am. I am picking Sam as the as the winner. No point Dude, guard. You, you no problem. Guards. You hate guards. What's going on? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> Honestly, here's the, here's the thing. Like Sam, like Sam is. I, I already see this. Right. We're gonna post this on the forums. People are gonna email us. A lot of people are gonna pick Sam's, and some people are just gonna say, "Yo, he has Zion and Ja. That's all. Like that's that's all the answer I need." It's kind of like the debate about who's the best player of all time, and people go, "Well, Jordan has six rings." They're just gonna say he has Zion, and that's all I need to know. Uh, it, that's really what I mean. Having a number one pick is advantageous and, in that regard. And I don't think Okafor gets enough respect for how dominant he was and how historical he was at the time. Who knew that Bagley was going to come later? I mean, what 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 Okafor did was just so dominant. I, I don't disagree, and and yeah. he he got a ring for it. So, all right, the, the Mitch, thing, I, I I got to tell Mitch, you, wait, wait, when Mitch said. He was going with the end of the draft. I was like, oh, he loves my pick of Vernon Carey. He loves <laughs> I, and and I didn't I get no love. I get nothing. I got nothing. The the you mentioned Mitch, um, the uh like historic nature of, of Okafor. I want to come back and just highlight how awesome Marvin Bagley was one more time. I know Donald mentioned this when he talked about him, but we had seen like to that point, we had seen nothing like Marvin Bagley the third when when he came to do like he was. I thought he was like the most otherworldly player um, in terms of, I remember Kyrie coming onto campus and being like, I never seen a dude at Duke who, who does the things that he does, but like 
he's an awesome NBA player. I've seen guys do things that, that Kyrie's doing on the floor. Like he's, you know, he had a lot of like Dwayne Wade in him when, when he came to college, I didn't know anyone that looked like Marvin Bagley. Um, that's the guy who like, you know, prior to, prior to Zion, um, like you said, was, they invented, they invented second jump. Yeah. They invented second jump for, mm-hmm. for Marvin. I mean, like it existed, yeah. but no one talked about it until it was him. And everyone was like, wow, like th- this guy is from another planet. So we are just, we are, we are blessed with, uh, with all kinds of awesome players who, uh, who have come through Duke, who have just been the, one of one. The, the fact that Marvin Bagley has not been a better NBA basketball player is one of the most inexplicable things I've ever seen in my life. I think it goes to show, but now he's in the Pistons. So now he's going to be fine. Also, I will say this about Marvin Bagley. When we did the like episodes with him, the fact like we would be, we would, he was the first guy that he would not have a double double. We'd be like, yo, what happened to him? He had an off game. He had 27 and in nine. Like what happened? He like, he never does this. He always, I mean, he to average a double double in college is amazing. All right. So that's going to wrap it for our conversation about the uh, the one and done teams. We will be posting uh, the teams on the DBR forums, um, the, the Duke Basketball Report forums. We encourage you folks, if you're not someone who posts there all the time, please go post there all the time. But especially please go to the thread that talks about Duke's best one and done team. And, and we will have our teams there and, and we will encourage folks to post their comments there. Mitch does not get the last word. <laughs> Are you sure? Uh, Are we sure that yeah. he doesn't get the last word? We're sure. Mitch does not get the last word on this. The other thing is you can you can email to us at dbrpodcast at gmail.com. Write to us and let us know who you think has picked the best team. You can explain why Mitch was completely wrong in not mentioning my team as the best team if you want. But before we go, Mitch, I do want to do one more thing with you. I, I Talk to me a little bit about your experiences as a Duke fan. Do you have like one great memory? What, what, is the, what is the Duke thing that defines Mitchell Davis? Well, I don't think it'll surprise anyone who knows Duke history that I had to pick a time from after when I was a student because I was there during Coach K's second and third seasons, those infamous uh, losing oh, yeah. seasons in 82 and 83. And I was fortunate enough to go to one final four in 1999. Uh, As you all know, what a great team that year. So I actually became an iron Duke just for that year with the expectation that there would be final four tickets uh, down the road. And sure enough, uh, there were. uh, Dude, that's savvy. That is smart. (laughs) So it was in St. Petersburg in 1999 at the Tropicana Dome. And when I got the tickets, they said distant view on them. And I didn't know what distant view meant till about the fourth escalator that I had to go up to, to, to get to the seats. And literally the court was about two inches big. I mean, I, it was, you can't even describe how far away you could be from a basketball court. But I'm rationalizing and thinking, I'm in the building, I'm in the building. So the first game starts and it's Connecticut and um, Ohio State, I believe. And I don't really care about the game. So we were just sitting there watching this little tiny court. And then Duke comes out to warm up for the second game. And the section that I'm in goes insane, which is incredible because we're so far from the court. Like we're a mile from the court and these people are going crazy. And I realized that I am in the last row of the Iron Iron Duke section. And behind us are the students from camera. I don't know how they give out tickets today, but 99, the entire Cameron crazies were in the same section where we were sitting right behind us and they are going nuts. So the game starts and people are trying to get them to sit down. And in unison, they all start chanting, we don't sit, we don't sit. So security comes over and and you got to realize how bizarre it is because we're so far from the court. I mean, standing makes no difference. And they all start chanting in unison at security, arrest us all, arrest us all. Then the first timeout comes. And what do alumni do, middle-aged people, when the timeout comes? We all stand up. And the students all sit. So they're sitting. We're standing during the timeout. The timeout ends. The alumni sit down. And the students start chanting in unison up in front. Instead of yelling down in front like people normally would at a sporting event, they're chanting at the alumni in unison, you know, up in front. So that was my memory of the, the final four. It, I wouldn't have traded that seat for a courtside seat. It was so exciting sitting there, especially on Saturday when we won, and everybody's high-fiving each other. See you Monday night. See you Monday night. 
And then, of course, the sad memory of Monday. That game, if you watched it live, it ended incredibly fast. There were none of these timeouts every 10 seconds. It's not like the last minute took. Trajan Langdon falls down, bringing the ball up. There's a turnover, and the game's over. And it's, and everyone thought we were going to win. It was so shocking that we could have lost that game. There was such optimism of everyone in the crowd, like, we're coming back, we're coming back, we got this. And then all of a sudden it was over. So, And that is a – I love that story. That That is – you, you came through, Mitch, in a big, big way. <laughs> um, Mitch, Mitch, can, can I also come back and ask, because we had discussed this in our, our email exchange with you, but uh, so you, you attended Duke as a Fuqua student, right? Uh, yes. Once upon yeah. a time. So we are, we are fellow Fuqua alumni. Um, but for, for undergraduate, you attended Pomona College. Is that right? Yes. I came to Fuqua right after college. I did not take any time off. Um, and as I think what you're leading up to is the basketball coach at Pomona College during my time there was Greg Popovich, now of the Spurs. And this was his first head coaching position. He had gone to the Air Force Academy. Um, He had done his military service as an assistant coach at Air Force. And his first head coaching job was at Pomona, who has a joint basketball team with Pitzer College. So when you see the pictures, you'll see the players wearing these Pomona Pitzer jerseys, which are really two different schools. And I was looking for a work-study job while I was at Pomona and got hired as the student manager. So I, Popovich's first year at Pomona was my junior year, and I was the head basketball manager for the two seasons, his first two years um, as a head coach. And um, did you know back, back then in the 70s that Greg Popovich was going to become like one of the most famous basketball coaches of all time, coaching, Pop- coaching at a Division three school? Okay, Popovich's first year at Pomona, the team finished two and twenty-two. That was his first head coaching. Ouch. So you, you think Coach K had it rough? Two and twenty-two, and the only time we ever were t- mentioned in the newspaper was we lost to Caltech, who had a ninety-nine game conference losing streak. So when we lost to Caltech, that was. Uh, we beat them in the rematch. So that was one of our two wins was that was the rematch against Caltech. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a very rough first year. So no, uh, no one ever expected that he would go on to the NBA. But I think that the key to the whole thing was Popovich started a year before coach K. So Popovich's first year was 79, 80. And another new coach in 79, 80 was Larry Brown at UCLA. And UCLA lost in the championship game that year to Louisville. And Popovich and Larry Brown somehow, I don't know if that's when they met. I'm guessing that's when they met. And we even went to a UCLA practice. He brought the team out to Westwood. And we sat in the the stands and watched UCLA practice. And many years later, like I want to say 85, 86, he became an assistant coach for Larry Brown for a season. He took his sabbatical. And the part that nobody ever tells when you read these articles was he was also an assistant to Dean Smith at North Carolina that year. He spent a couple months with North Carolina and a couple months with Kansas. He hated the Carolina experience. He was one of a thousand assistants um, and never really you know, clicked. But he and Larry Brown became very good friends and he ultimately was the best man at one of Larry Brown's weddings. I'm not sure which wedding it was. I think there were multiple. But that's how, when he decided to go to the NBA, um, he became an assistant coach for Larry Brown um, at San Antonio. And then when Brown left, he followed Don Nelson around, and he became known as a defensive whiz assistant coach, and then ultimately became the general manager of the Spurs, you know, president of basketball operations. And it was at, and they had Tim Duncan. Uh, wait, no, the. Um, they did not have Tim Duncan yet. I think it was just David Robinson. Yeah, right. Before before they drafted Duncan out of Wake right. Forest. And, right. He was the coach when they drafted Duncan. And so how and, much how much of Coach Pop's uh, ultimate success does he credit back to the uh, to the to the non playing staff at the Pomona Pitzer uh, program? <laughs> like how much credit do you how much credit do you want to take for for Coach Popovich? All of it. All Great. of it. Uh, I mean, he was right obviously, That's the right answer. <laughs> he, he, no, I mean, he was obviously 
clearly a very intense, talented person. And I would just, you know, not confuse the TV persona with what the real man is like. The real man is one of the warmest, nicest, friendliest people that you would ever want to spend time with. He's thoughtful, articulate, um, and he plays this grumpy old man on TV. But that's not who he oh, is. Oh, but I love it. His 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 interviews, his sideline interviews with the with the courtside reporters are just amazing. Uh, dude is well, a and, legend. And, and and there have been I've read multiple articles about uh, uh, speaking exactly, Mitch, to what you were just saying. Where off the court, he's he's like the you know in the in the same way that people talk about Coach K, like building this enormous network of of basketball family. It sounds like Coach Popovich has done something similar, and and maybe. Uh, that's why they, they both ended up being head coaches for Team USA because there's sort of a, there's an inherent quality to that that you the, need the, to be successful. There's a, a Netflix uh, show called Quantum Hoops that is about Caltech basketball because after they beat Pomona in the game that I was at, they then went on to lose something like 300 straight conference games, like 20 years worth of conference games. And when they finally broke the streak, Popovich, who was by then, you know, the the big name that he is today reached out to Caltech and the, the quantum hoops show talks about Popovich sending them some presents and contacting the team and congratulated them on breaking the streak because most of them had no idea about that that he had lost to them in his very first season so yeah he uh he, he's very good about staying connected to people and just like the brotherhood he he's always reuniting when he's in LA with people from his college days. Mitch, so so thanks again for, for joining us and congratulations for uh, winning the DVR Bracket Challenge. Any feedback for us that you'd like to share live on the show? Uh, you have not been prepared for this. So, um, you know, yeah, if dude, you have you're anything... You put oh, I'm putting him on the spot. Big time here. I'm yeah. putting him on the spot. Put all of us uh, on the spot. We did. I wasn't we expecting did the, that uh, question either. We did the we did the listener survey last summer uh, where we got we got a bunch of feedback that was that was very interesting and enlightening. Um, but because uh, you you did mention that you are a listener, it is it is one of the sort of awkward things about us offering the guest spot to the bracket challenge winner is that be like the bracket challenge is really like a DBR forum thing, and we recognize that not everyone who's on the DBR forums is a DBR podcast listener. So we've had a couple of years where either the person just never responded uh, and, and was just like, like it didn't exist or they were like, I'm not interested, like <laughs> not, <laughs> not listeners of the show. So we, so we get lucky when we get someone who, uh, who actually reads the forum and, and is a listener to the show. Cause then we, we uh, take advantage of that synergy. And, and by the way, Mitch, it is worth noting um, that uh, Sam's doing the editing here. So, uh, so if you say something that he doesn't like, he'll just edit it out. No, nah, I'm a big I'm a big feedback guy. Uh, so so I, I could take it. Uh, no matter how constructive I try to make the constructive criticism, it's still um, I, I'll try to make it as nice as I can. <laughs> Do it. Um, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. I, I, I hear Jason talk all the time about Ion College Basketball, which is a podcast I also love listening to Norlander and Parrish. And you'll notice one of the things that they do is they save the small talk for the end and they'll go on and on. And it's very entertaining. Um, it adds a lot of color to the podcast. When you guys do the small talk, you oftentimes do it at the beginning. And I would jump right into the news of the day. I, it's really interesting hearing about the barbecue in Durham and problems you're having with your internet or traffic or health and whatnot. But I would rather, I want to hear the news. I want to hear, especially when there's breaking news. I would, I, I would love to hear that first and say the small talk. This is, this is noted. helpful. Uh, this is great stuff, man. No, yeah. We've, yeah. We, we, we've, we've heard this before. Uh, and, and I just, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, if you know me in real life, uh, I'm a, I'm kind of a small talk guy. So uh, I'm, I'm just prone to, to this sort of discussion ahead of time. So, so I don't, you won't, I won't hurt your feelings that I fast forward. Past. No, 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 no. It's totally, it's totally, no, if, if people are fast forwarding through the first few minutes of the show, like whatever, that's fine. Um, you know, but I, thank I you for that. You I appreciate speed it. I listen to the podcast that either. So yeah, wait, what speed do you listen at? <laughs> uh, 1.5. You can, I'm a 1.5 guy. I'm you think we're, guy. you think you can listen to us at 1.5. I think we talk too fast for 1.5. I think we're a 1.3 show. <laughs> that's my that's my i, I especially I, I noticed that i especially when i listen to 1.5 i'm like 
Thank God I know what I'm saying because <laughs> I, well, I, I listen. Really <laughs> I, I listen to myself at 1.5. I listen to everything at 1.5, but listening to us at 1.5 lets me know that I need to slow my roll sometimes. And I and it's made me a better podcaster. See, I listen to a lot of NPR, and I can do that at like 1.7 because uh, yeah. those folks those folks are trained differently. Uh, they've got. So I, I I I, li- I love the daily, and I always listen to it at 1.5. The daily from the New York Times. Um, I, I was in the car with my son recently, and he was like, "Oh, I can't listen at 1.5. I need to listen at regular speed." I couldn't even listen to the day. It was so frustrating to listen to it at regular speed. I couldn't. It, it, it. it sounds like they're all on painkillers or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It sounds like they have COVID. I, I don't know. Am I am I speaking slower today? Because no, of you're not. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my my voice is scratchy. I'm going to need to take such a break after this. This is so much talking. By the way, Mitch, I was going to say. I think one of the reasons we do the small talk at the beginning is that by the end of this, we're usually kind of tuckered out. Like <laughs> um, it, 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 it takes effort to get through these things. But we appreciate we appreciate the feedback, though. It's it, it is helpful. And we will consider well, putting the small talk at the end. Well, uh, and I will tell you that when, you know, podcasts drop on the same day, I always listen to DBR before I listen to Iron College Basketball. So oh, well, that's yeah, good. I appreciate you that. You always uh, come first. We're leaving I'm that also, in for sure. I'm also an Iron <laughs> College Basketball listener. And I do. I, I consciously worry about there are times where they will put out a show before we record. And I really like their show too. And I'll listen to it. And I try to really avoid parroting anything that they say because, well, see, oh, uh, but it's so hard because, the, I because I usually agree the, with them. I was yeah. going to suggest the siren for the emergency pods because I love their siren when there's a coaching change or some infraction and they have an emergency podcast with the siren. All right. So uh, we've been on forever because folks, even though you're listening to this on like Tuesday or Wednesday, we recorded this on Sunday morning after we recorded the podcast that we released on Sunday. We've been on for like two plus hours. So we're going to wrap it up here. Mitch, Mitchell Davis, again, congratulations on your victory in the DBR bracket challenge. And, and thanks for, man, you were a great guest. Love the story about the 99 tournament, uh, 99 final four. That, is, that was a great story. We really appreciate you being a part of this podcast. Um, for Donald and Sam, I am Jason. I'm not even going to let anybody else talk. Everybody's done. We're finished. This is DBR Podcast, probably number 421. Might be 422. If something big happened, this is 422. But it's probably 421 episode in the books. DBR band or Duke band, I mean. <laughs> like we have a DBR band. Duke band. We have a band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Play us out and take us home. Appreciate it. Wait, so you're you're in LA? Yeah. In fact, I, I don't know if he'd mentioned it on the pod how the two wins in San Francisco were Coach K's first two West Coast tournament wins. Yeah. Because I have seen so many seasons end in Anaheim. It's just been awful. Oh. I'm pretty sure oh. Kyrie's mm-hmm. season ended. Yep. Um to Arizona. Here. Yeah. Yep. Derek Williams. It's just it's just been awful. The other thing I'm curious about is they used to play UCLA almost every year in the 80s. And you I know remember why they don't, you know why they didn't anymore? I know they had a, a falling out, but I don't know why. I, I'm in Cherokee parks. So Duke played UCLA all the time. I'm pretty sure it was Cherokee was the one Duke played UCLA all the time. And it started to sort of leak out that one reason we were always playing them was, was coach K loved recruiting California kids. And it was a chance for us to get out there and be in front of them and be, and, and Duke and UCLA were really battling for Cherokee parks. Cherokee went to Duke. Um, and, uh, whoever was UCLA coach at the time, I blanked on whoever it was, but they were sort of like, I'm done. I'm not bringing them out here anymore so they can recruit the best players in California. And we haven't played them since. Wait, so it was, so those first few years, I would see them. I remember one year they came out to play USC, but the the regular thing was the the, the home and homes with UCLA all those years. And then it stopped. And they, I don't think they've played since. We we haven't addressed this, but I one of the things that John Shire could bring back is home and homes with with big time programs. Um, I don't know if he's bold enough or if he's if he's going to be allowed to because I know that the money is better. Um, Cherokee Parks was in ninety. He was being recruited like ninety three, ninety four, or something like that, right? He was because that was Jim Herrick. 
Wasn't he on right the, before the, Steve? Lavin. Wait, wasn't he on the ninety? Wasn't Cherokee Parks on the ninety two team? He was on the ninety two team. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it was Jim Herrick, like early nineties. Yeah, and Jim he Her- was um, Cherokee. He was recruited in ninety two. He was on that. He was a freshman on that team, but I, and I think that the Duke UCLA series ended a year or two after that. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty and, sure and I remember people... seeing Bobby Hurley. Um, you know. It, it one of the UCLA games, so maybe they played in ninety or ninety one. All right, we're going to. We're, I'm going to Sports Reference. We're checking this. We Five played at like UCLA that. in ninety two. It looks like we played. We played UCLA in Cameron in ninety three. Uh, no UCLA in ninety four. So they would have there made the schedule. Job, Jason. Yep, yeah. a year, a year, a couple years after Cherokee Park. Right. So Cherokee Park was a freshman in ninety two. Is yep. that right? So yeah, yeah. So like two years later. Oh. There's your answer, Mitch. So oh, I have I, felt kind of like a bad luck charm because I have seen so many Duke losses in the tournament did, when they were, you know, in the West. Did you region. go to the did you go to the San Francisco games? Yes, I went to both. Okay. Um so that's good at least. Yeah, I was gonna give a, a shout out, but it just there was no place to put it in. When I got my even though those two years I was at Duke, the team was, you know, had losing records, it was still so exciting to be in Cameron. Um, we beat North Carolina State the year they won the championship. That was they were ranked like 15th. And I remember being at that game, and it was so great. And there were a lot of close games. I mean, they 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 lost obviously to the Appalachian States and the Stetsons, but they they were close games. And uh, I had a friend who was a combined business school law school, so he started Coach K's first year. I got there a second year, and he was at Coach K's first game and we met up in san francisco and we went to the games together at the chase arena with I love it. play and my friend was going to go to the final four he couldn't get the flights to get there for the saturday but he was going to go for the final game to be there really for coach k's last game and his first game but was it meant last. to be yeah jason and i were there That's yeah i know <laughs> um fun fun trip with a with a lousy uh outcome exactly yeah. but at least right. i got to see two games there was always the risk i was only going to get to see the texas tech game and i wound up getting to see yeah, that's both. true and it was that's true it was um, great super cool 